Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City on this Easter Sunday during Ramadan and just after Passover. Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, and Native Americans also have sacred observations this week, and so it really feels like a special and holy time for a lot of people. Whatever observations are meaningful for your family, I hope that you are able to celebrate in peace this week and recognize our common humanity across our religious differences. If you are visiting with us today, you are our honored guest, and we are so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for choosing us on Easter Sunday. Thank you for being here. We'd love to have you stop by our welcome table just outside this door in Elliott Hall after worship. Let us introduce ourselves to you and get to know you a little better as well. I have a few announcements of church activities before we begin in earnest. First, some announcements of upcoming church ceremonies. This Friday, April 22nd at 10 a.m., you are invited to the memorial service for Bill and Ruth Olson. And you are also invited to attend the memorial service of Barbara Woody at 11 o'clock on April 30th. You can find both information about both of these services, which will be held here in our chapel, in your torch email, or you can ask me after service. Next week, the Women's Sacred Circle of our church invites you to join them for a ceremony for another old friend who has died, a maple tree here on our property. We will express our gratitude to this tree in a brief ceremony between worship services next Sunday morning. And finally, our last new member ceremony of this year will be on Sunday, May 1st, during worship. If you would like to officially join the congregation, this is your chance. Please let us celebrate you. Membership in a congregation is not to be undertaken lightly, and it carries responsibilities, one of which is voting on important business of the congregation. If you would like to vote at our May meeting, including voting on the annual budget and our new officers, please send me a note and let me know that you're interested in becoming a new member. Now, you may have already seen this in our email newsletter, but this week we said goodbye to our sexton of 16 years, 16, 17, Lane Owens. Yeah, you may never have met Lane. He wasn't usually around on Sunday mornings. He's one of those people who makes church happen in the background. But he was really important to us. Um, he cared for our church in big and small ways for a long time. We had a nice lunch for him at staff meeting, but he was in a hurry to get to his new job at Weber State, and it's three minutes from his house, and he can ride his motorcycle. Super cool. <laughs> he was taking the front runner down from Ogden? Yeah, long drive. So, so you won't be able to say goodbye, but maybe you could pass on your goodbyes through his brother David, who's still with us. Finally, I have some big news to share. You've been asking for this for a long time. Are you ready? Yes. We have a picture directory. Woo! Woo! So exciting. And I have the first copy. It has 46 people in it. <laughs> do you know why? Because you have to do your Breeze profile in order to get into the directory. What is Breeze? It's our new church management software to which all of you were invited back in January. So we're gonna have to give it another try in order for this to have 300 and whatever people in it. Please watch your email for a message from Stephanie, either Monday or Tuesday. It's gonna have instructions on how to update your profile. You can put in your picture but you have to do it, we can't do it for you. So please watch for that email, take action on it as soon as you get it, and then we will have a picture directory that we can use. Thank you. All right. Now, we begin our Easter Sunday service with the lighting of the chalice. 
Today I'm lighting it with these words by the Reverend M. Barclay. Keep your proclamations of grandeur. Give me an Easter as small as a seed, one that can be planted while it's still cold outside, one that can be watered with tears and demands time and patience to grow. I don't need to know how large it will become, how long until it blossoms, or even if it will be pretty. I only want it to grow roots that dig deep down, striving for life in the underbelly of the world. Spare me the cosmic promises of otherworldly escape and point me to the sacred possibilities within reach. Tell me again about how the nutrients born from decay keep even the saddest places brimming with potential for life. Easter is hard for me as a Christian and as a pastor. Christmas is easy. The birth of hope and joy into the world, the potential for a new way of living, the dawn of promise. But I struggle with Easter. Not because I worry that the story of the passion of Jesus isn't relevant to the times we live in. The story of the passion of Jesus will continue to be relevant as long as we live under the shadow of empire, as long as nations seek to conquer and colonize each other and their own people, as long as there are walls and fences and occupied territories and demilitarized zones that separate and control and threaten people and destroy the land. The story of the passion of Jesus will continue to be relevant as long as the bodies of black and brown people are sacrificed to empire as long as they are turned over to be executed for speaking out, as long as they are commodified by the war machine or objectified by people in power to send a message, as long 
as their parents and siblings and neighbors gather at the foot of their crosses to collect their bodies and wail. The story of the passion of Jesus will continue to be relevant as long as there is sufficient tragedy in our lives to bring us to our knees begging that this cup pass from us, as long as the experience of being betrayed or denied by our friends breaks our hearts, as long as people continue to fall asleep while waiting for the revolution. So as a preacher, I'm not worried about the passion of Jesus becoming irrelevant because tragically, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, that is not a story that happened one time thousands of years ago. It's a story that continues to take place every day all around the world, including right here where we live. But what do we do with Easter? What do we do with this resurrection? Because on Easter, we are conditioned to expect the denouement of this story. The, sto the stone rolled away, the empty tomb, the good news of eternal life. Death has no power over him. He is risen. Glory, hallelujah. We expect it even if we don't believe it. Because we want so much to believe that all of this tragedy is leading towards something. Something that has meaning. Something that makes sense. We've sat at the foot of some crosses ourselves, haven't we? Weeping, grieving. We've been to the tomb. Maybe not Jesus' cross, Jesus' tomb, but we've spent a holy Saturday or two at the cemetery or the crematorium. We've attended a few memorials in our day. We open the paper or our web browser in the morning and attend a funeral on a city street nearby or half a world away. We see violence and death everywhere. Death does have power, a banal, stupid power, an all-consuming power that doesn't bend at all to our rage, our fists pounding against its chest, a power that buries us in grief, and then someday just buries us. So yeah, some eternal life would be nice for once. I'll take some unreasonable hope along with my deviled eggs and chocolate bunnies. <laughs> After all we've been through, resurrection doesn't seem like too much to ask. But that's not the whole story. The other side of the story is that life is already eternal. The universe is alive. Death is not an end to life, but a part of life, a change, a transformation from one kind of life to another. Science makes this increasingly plain to us. Life is a constant process of arising and becoming and transforming. You don't have to jump through hoops or follow a bunch of weird arcane rules or behave in ways that deny your humanity to achieve eternal life. You already have it. You're in it right now. Breathe in. And you're breathing in the atmosphere that took millions of years to form. Look down at your hands. They're made of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus. Formed in space, gathered by gravity, kindled by the fires of the stars themselves. Every person who's ever lived is alive in you. And when this body that you know dies and falls apart, it will come back together in all the things and all the people that live after you. Maybe death is a stupid jerk, but it's also an illusion. We already have eternal life. 
As I was reading the accounts of the death of Jesus this week, I was struck by how Jesus chose to spend his last days. He staged a parade to mock the emperor of Rome and flipped over a bunch of tables in the temple. Audacious living, fearless. The kind of things that we think we would only have the courage to do if we had nothing left to lose. But that's not all he was doing. Jesus also gathered his people together to try to knit them more tightly to each other, to strengthen his community so that they were ready to face down whatever was coming for them. His final teachings were about how to have the strength to live in a world filled with so much cruelty and pain. Share your table, feed each other, wash each other's feet. This bereaved woman, she's your mother now. Take responsibility for each other serve each other, and love each other lavishly. In John's Gospel, I was especially moved by this story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Listen to what it says. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was around him. Where did Jesus find the inner resources to love people like this? Because he knew that everything already belonged to him. He was so certain of his place in the world. He knew where he came from and where he was going. He was so certain of the love and care of the God of his understanding that he needed nothing and therefore could give everything. What would it be like to be that free? To not worry about anything because all my needs are supplied. To live and love other people as if I have nothing to lose because everything is mine. Well, I wouldn't claim to know anything about that. (laughs) But when I can get a glimpse of it, I can see that the way that it happens, the only way that it happens, is in community. When we are all taking care of each other, when that care is so rich and so trustworthy that we can relax and simply love other people the way we want to be loved. Love is what gives our lives meaning, and it is what remains when we are gone. So how big can you love? How big can you love? How many seats can you fit around your table? What audacious acts of service, what fearless acts of resistance would you undertake if you had nothing to lose? How would you live this day if you really understood that you have eternal life?
Uh, now's the time for our offertory. Um, there is the story of the passion, right? The passion, so often it feels like uh, we use it in a different way in our common language, like to have passion. Um, it actually means suffering, uh, traditionally, right? The, the suffering of Jesus, passion of Jesus. And as Monica so brilliantly illustrated, the suffering of the world is heavy. The suffering here in Salt Lake City is heavy. You know, it really, it, dis, it is so alarming for me to drive through and see the tents all through the city. And sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming because you're like, what, <laughs> what can we do? Um, and particularly when you, you're just like, what can I do? And the truth is like, as an individual, not much. I honestly can't do that much. Um, but when I join with you, when I become uh, part of a vision with you, actually, it can be very moving, very hopeful, very powerful. Even a, a, little, a little Unitarian Universalist church, that people are like, what, what is that? Well, actually, that's not what they say. They're like, what is the Universalist Unitarian church all the time, <laughs> right? They don't even know what the name is. Um, <laughs> We're not going to solve all of it, right? Because we, we have this many hands. But there is an infection, right? Um, Desmond Tutu calls it being a God carrier. That when you are filled with hope, when you are filled with vision, that you are able to inspire others. And more than any act, right? We, we're here to act, but more than anything else, we are here to generate hope. That change is possible, that this, the, the, what we live right now is not the end. That there is another way. That, for me, is this solely how I understand my role, and solely how I want to re you know, relate to you that we can live with an idea of hope in our hearts, that that's what this place is. It is a place that you come to be filled with the hope so that you can go out carrying the divine with you, so that in every action and interaction that you have with other people, you're telling them about the hope, that this isn't the way it has to be. So thank you for your support in making this place uh, the location of hope, the foundation of hope, this fountain of hope for us. As we move through the world, it can feel like the tides are heavy, right? And so you touch one another, you come and sit with one another, you share a vision with one another so that it doesn't feel isolating, that it feels like you're part of something and that you can bring a new day. The offertory will now be accepted. Thank you.
Love the bells. So good. Easter can be hard. There are so many people who lay claim to the Easter story, and they often have very specific interpretations of what it meant and what it means to us today. These interpretations vary widely and often conflict with one another. But ultimately, we are asked to make sense of the experience of a man who dies brutally and then rises from the dead. You know, let's linger for a moment on the vehicle of his death. The crucifixion is a very common symbol uh, in our culture. So common, in fact, that we often don't even think about what's happening in that symbol. It adorns just about every corner of our culture, some sacred and beautiful, some incredibly profane and offensive. And due to our overexposure of the symbol, we often don't even really see it anymore. But this is a symbol of a man with massive hand, nails through his hands and through his feet, who is suspended in such a way that he is slowly suffocating over the course of a few hours as his rib cage collapses into his lungs. In Jesus' case, he died relatively quickly. Some of the victims of this Roman capital punishment took days to die. And the Romans killed thousands of people in this excruciating fashion. The word excruciating is actually derivative of the word crucifixion. And of those thousands of people who died on the cross, all of them have been lost to history all except for one. Rebecca Parker and Rita Nakashima Brock in their book, Saving Paradise, talk about the purpose of what happened, not just to Jesus, but to his followers as well. They write, the passion narratives broke silence about the shame and the fear the crucifixion instilled. To lament was to claim powers that crucifixion was designed to destroy dignity, courage, love, creativity, and truth-telling. In telling his story, his community remembered his name and claimed the death-defying power of saying his name out loud. To break silence whenever violence is used to shame, to instill fear, fragment human community, or suppress those advocating for justice is life-giving. Life is found in surviving the worst a community can imagine, in lamenting the consequences of imperialism, and in holding fast to the core goodness of this world, blessed by divine justice and abundant life. Even now, that Jesus has become the God of the empire. There is and will always be something countercultural when telling his story, no matter how sanitized, no matter how contorted the story becomes in order to fit the desires of the powerful. The message of Jesus will always rest in his own words, perhaps best laid out for me anyway, in Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was, prison and I was in prison, and you visited me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. 
And then he will say to those at his left hand, you that, that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you gave me, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. In remembering, in the great memorial that is Easter, there is a saying of the name that defies individuality and lifts up all those who have been lost to history. Just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And so it is also with the crucifixion. Just by engaging the story at this level, it's difficult because at the center lies the drama of the suffering. And the suffering can become very political when people make it redemptive. You know, in, in seminary, they call it atonement sacrifice, right? That somebody's put up there and they, they take away your sin. Like, they atoned for you. That's crap. <laughs> that doesn't happen. When I was in seminary, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ came out. There was a lot of controversy at the time because the depictions of Jesus' final hours were portrayed in what some called overt gruesomeness. And perhaps it was Gibson's politics that actually turned people off, but I think some, much, of the repudiation of this movie received by religious liberals occurred because the story of the suffering really is just not part of our understanding of who Jesus was and what he means to us. We, we really like how he lived, right? Because we don't like that atonement suffering. And several of my colleagues openly declared that they would not go see the movie. This was not their Jesus. The suffering of his death was not the story. It was the consequence. He was executed for challenging authority, not redeeming humanity. Public displays of power through cruelty was the technique used by empires to quash rebellions and discourage behavior it did not like. Suffering was just the consequence. It was what happens when you get caught up in the system. And I can understand the resistance. The idea of suffering as redemptive has been used far too often to tell women to stay with abusive men, to tell the poor and the oppressed that they are loved the best by God. They should just wait for their prize. It will be in heaven. Too often, people who only talk about the cross, who only talk about the redemptive suffering, are the same people who want to leave out any message of equality. We're all familiar with people who see the, the telling of the Jesus story as their whole life, and they are some of the most mean-hearted and abusive people in our culture. People who seem completely at odds with the least of these in our society. And there's something almost perverse in their ardor for the crucifixion. It often feels like profound hypocrisy. And, and I think it is a huge mistake to leave the suffering out of the story of his message. Was he caught up in the system? Was he punished by a regime whose only response to rebellion was violence, public excruciating violence? Yes. We have our own prison industrial complex. Was this the consequence of his actions rather than the central point of his message? No. No, it was much more than that. And the unwillingness of progressives to look squarely at the suffering and death means that we also have been unwilling and unable to understand the full meaning of Jesus or perhaps more accurately, the Christ. And here, I would really like to make a distinction between the two. Very often, the term Christ appears to be part of Jesus' name. Like, like Dobbins. 
No. Sometimes, really, you see it, Christ like a title, Christ Jesus, right? Because it is. Matthew 1.16, we read the line, Jesus who is called Christ. This is because the term Christ comes from a Greek translation of the Hebrew word for the anointed one, the Messiah, the deliverer. At the time of Jesus, there was no unified understanding of Judaism, and some Jews believed that someone was going to come and deliver them from suffering and persecution, the Messiah, the Christ. In this situation, the Christ the sacred power of God that saves humanity, that rescues humanity, that revives and restores the meaning and purpose of our lives was understood as coming through a single person, a prophet. And it is here that the story of the suffering is so important, the suffering of the Christ. When we talk about the Christ, it is our habit in our culture to talk about the man who lived 2,000 years ago. But the Christ, the sacred power of God to save and restore humanity is much larger than any single man. And it continues as a presence among us. This is why Andrew Harvey writes, our world is burning and the divine is being crucified over and over again. When we as Unitarian Universalists say revelation is continuous, right? That's one of our sort of theological statements. We say that revelation is continuous. We are not simply saying that God is still speaking and moving through us and moving us towards awakening. It is also that the crucifixion is not a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. If we are honest about the state of the world, the state of the Christ of the world, we haven't actually arrived at Easter yet. We're still at Good Friday. The earth is burning. The animals are suffering. They're still stuck on the cross. They all live beneath our dominion. The suffering is real. It's not abstract. One of the failures of religious liberals is that for too long we have wanted to play with the God only in the light. Right? God is love, we say. But if we want to be part of the transformation, we must also take time to encounter the shadow of our behaviors, to stand wide-eyed and witness the suffering, to tell its story, to not allow it to be forgotten, to not let it be the end, and in doing so, to snatch power away from the oppressors who use violence to keep people silent. This is the meaning of Black Lives Matter. It is profoundly theological. The gunning down of Young black men by the state, we refuse to to be silent. We must say their names. We must refuse to be silent about the men who are still, still illegally detained in Guantanamo. Some of them are still there. When we refuse to be silent, When we talk about the the crucifixion, not as redemption, not as substitution, but as memorial, we hold aloft the names of the least of these. But the death of Jesus is only one half of the Easter story. The other half of the story is that rebirth is possible. Something must die. But there is resurrection. We know this from our own story. As we have struggled along the journey of our lives, we know that rebirth requires death. We cannot be the person we want to be without the person we are right now dying first. Cannot be the culture that we want to be without the culture we are right now dying first. You cannot be the church that you want to be, the one you want to be, without the one you are right now dying first. And dying is never easy. There are so many attachments. Attachments to all of those aspects of our lives that we believe give us definition, who who we believe tell us who we are. Attachments to what we believe is right and what we believe is wrong. Some people talk about enlightenment or awakening as being the death of the ego. Personally, I find this obfuscating. The ego does not disappear. It cannot disappear. 
nor should, it, should we try to have it disappear. If I am unable to distinguish myself from others, I'm left in a paralyzed position. Enlightenment or awakening is not about the death of the ego, but the death of our attachments to the ego. Right? Without the ego, we would be unable to act in the world, but without attachments to the ego, we are able to let go of, of feeling that we are separate beings. I can see the distinction that allows me to act, but I am aware that I am of the same source as you, that we are interwoven, that we are bonded together. The death of our attachments allows us to awaken to the great becoming of existence. The common and simple way of differentiating between uh, Trinitarians and Unitarians is our understanding of the divine. Trinitarians derive their name from the Trinity. Who's got it? First one. Second one. Third one. Oh, ghosts. These are ghost people. Sometimes you say Holy Spirit. Yeah, but the ghost. we got the ghost. Okay, that's good. Unitarian response is usually understood as a demotion of Jesus from the Godhead to human and the dissolution of the Holy Spirit into the divine oversoul. Right? And the Father, yeah, we don't, we don't really do the Father. <laughs> it's just, you know, the God. And perhaps, you know, both of these are wrong, Right? The fallacy of, of Trinitarianism seems to be the strict limitation of the Christ to the personhood of Jesus. And the fallacy of Unitarianism is the attachment to Jesus as not being the Christ in any way at all. When we speak about the coming of the Christ, those who are attached to the personhood of Jesus believe that some first century Jewish carpenter is going to return, <laughs> right? And those who are attached to the person of, personhood of Jesus as not being the Christ struggle to understand the concept of the coming of the Christ in any way. Now, I do believe in the coming of the Christ. Or more accurately, I believe the Christ is becoming. The Messiah, the Deliverer, is becoming. And it will not be in the form of a single person, but rather as millions of people who have encountered a spiritual awakening, who have died to their attachments, who have come to understand themselves not as separate beings, but as the living embodiment of the Christ. This is you. Three people in the back, brand new, they're like, I didn't know I was becoming the Christ. <laughs> You're becoming the Christ. <laughs> and Christ for you. I'm like Oprah out here. Christ for you. <laughs> you are the embodiment of the becoming. Not as individuals attached to your egos, right? But as spiritual beings who made your way here today because something is awakening in you. Something that is aware that it is dying, that is aware of the suffering, something that knows it must perish if it needs to be, if it wants to be reborn. It is a spiritual awakening that is becoming out of the vast suffering of the world as well as the great desire to awaken from it. If we want to take on the responsibility for the burning world, there is only one response. We must die to our attachments so that we can embrace the becoming. The Christ comprised of millions of awakened beings. The awakening is grounded in the suffering. It is not a dismissal of it. It is not a dressing up and a smoothing over of it. It is not abstract. It is real. Just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. When we understand ourselves not as distinct individuals separate from source, we will understand the meaning of Easter. And it is here that a new humanity will be reborn. The Christ is becoming. The anointed one is becoming. The deliverer is becoming. And it is all of us. We know the awakening is happening. We can feel it. We, 
Our call from the divine is to make haste and to put down our attachments, to set aside all of those things that keep us from seeing ourselves as indivisible from creation. And we do this so that we might all one day sing alleluia under the sun as one great being. Amen. You know, last week we held a service at the Great Salt Lake and uh, David brought, what do you call those? Romanian bird, Romanian bird whistles out and had the kids play them. And it was both beautiful and like heartbreaking, right? Because the Great Salt Lake is, it is essential for so many migratory birds and it is dying. Like, we're not just losing water, we're, we're losing birds. We're losing all of the food for the birds that, you know, what do I care about a, a fly, <laughs> right? It all lives, it all is woven together. And the birds, it was so beautiful, and I was like, boy. Anyways, the benediction. Source of life, God, my darling, inspire us as we walk out into the world today, knowing that we can't fix every tent person that we come across, we can't fix every single one, but we can not walk by them, pretending they're not there, that there is something in the hope that we can bring to the world, that every being, from the person sitting next to us in the pew to the birds of the Great Salt Lake, that every being has worth and dignity. And awaken us to the great space of interbeing, 
beyond birth and death, beyond boundary and fence and ego. Awaken us to the great source of all. And fill us with grace so we might have the courage to to be who we need to be for the least of these, for the members of our family to become the Christ and to be part of the healing of this world. Amen. Come again for next service. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, service is ended. If you're new, there's a welcome table out here. There's uh, coffee, all sorts of the good, all the good things are out there. Uh, special thanks to Monica Dobbins, David Owens, my ministerial companions, Tristan Moore up there, bringing us to the World Wide Web. All the things. Thank you so much. All right, let me make sure I get all the names. Bob Berger on organ, right? Amazing. So good. Marty Major, Becky Heal, uh, Jan and Paul Gandy, Holly Stewart, Jim Catano, John Major. Is that everyone? Did I get? Oh, my God. <laughs> Jim Thornburg. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>